battleground state. And in 2020, we have the opportunity to turn our state blue up and down the ballot. We have the opportunity to expand access to affordable health care, finance our public schools, strengthen our economy, and take meaningful action on gun violence. There's so much more in the United States Senate. We have the opportunity to pave the way towards a more sustainable future at the Texas Railroad Commission. We have the opportunity to elect judges and the justices who will restore fairness, equality, and balance in our courts. We have the opportunity to shape the political future of Texas and repair the broken systems that disenfranchise working families in our great state. We have the opportunity to ensure that Texans in positions of power embrace empathy, open minds, and swing open the doors of possibility by working together and uniting behind our shared vision of a more inclusive world, we will win back our state. We will win because we have to. We have to put an end to the hate, the lack of access, and the suffering. We have to deliver on the fair shot that every Texan deserves. Our cause, our movement, is about the restoration of justice and the expansion of opportunity. None of this can be accomplished unless we work together. In order to bring lasting change to Texas, we must work alongside every down-ballot candidate, every activist, and every Texas Democrat to continue building the largest democratic movement our state has ever seen. We're asking you to be a part of this historic fight. Together, we will create a Texas that we can all believe and thrive in. Together, we will save Texas and in turn, save the entire country. Join us. Join us. Texas is the biggest battleground state in the country. Our Democratic Party is building a future that is focused in equality and prosperity. Our mission is innovative, inclusive, and hopeful. We are creating a Texas that we can all believe and thrive in. Some of the boldest Democrats to navigate the halls of Congress have called Texas home, and some of them have even made their mark on the White House. Texas produces progressives, trailblazers, and steady-handed leaders alike who consistently push the needle on issue after issue. Our leaders champion the noblest of causes because we believe that our country is stronger when we celebrate diversity, live our values, and inspire unity. Texas Democrats have built a movement founded on landmark policies and programs that make America one of a kind. 
We safeguard our planet and fight for equal rights. We deliver on building an economy that works for all Texans. We defend a woman's right to choose, and we challenge the inhumane policies that set to tear our country apart. While Texas Democrats may differ in their approaches, each one of them has fought like hell to change the course of history and leave our state that much more equitable. We are the party that paves the way for the future because we cannot advance as a society until everyone has a seat at the table. Donald Trump can't win the White House without Texas, and we got a plan to defeat him. We know that the strength and resilience of our movement means that we can overcome any challenge set before us. We know that we will succeed because what we are fighting for is humane, it is just, and it is truthful. Every day, little by little, our movement grows and our chants for justice ring louder. We are shaping the political future of our state and ensuring that everyone has a fair shot at the American dream. This is what it means to be a Texas Democrat. Because when we save Texas, we save our democracy. And when we save our country, we save the world. district is I'm sure you Preston Colcarney and uh, uh, the three biggest towns in the district are Sugarland Pearland and Katy and then folks over in Clear Lake they asked me well why don't you have a C in your name for Clear Lake and I said, we can tell I become a congressman <laughs> Shree Preston Colcarney I'll add a C for that so easy I think I thank my mom for that friend <laughs> <laughs> you were made for this yeah. you were made for this position <laughs> all right well so I got some questions for you yeah. and then we're gonna play a quick game at the end um, and I'm excited to learn a little bit more about you. So, if I'm not, you just had a birthday this week, correct? That, that is true. My my birthday was uh, on Tuesday. Today's Thursday. Yeah, it's October sixth. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling a little busy. Did you have any time to celebrate? So it's actually uh, funny. I wasn't sure we could do it safely during the pandemic, but uh, our team organized a socially distant birthday party. So it was out back behind the uh, parking lot outside of our, our building. Everybody was wearing masks. Everybody stayed apart. But you know what? We've been missing each other so much. I mean, last in, in 2018, there was just such an energy, this grassroots campaign, 1,500 volunteers. And, and, you know, I think people needed that. So being able to do it safely was a challenge, but we were. And I think uh, people really appreciated that because that's going to give us that boost we needed to get the, the last four weeks before Election Day. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, Fort Bend County, where you are in Sheboygan area, mm -hmm. is such a cool spot. And the energy there is so exciting to be in. I have went campaigned with you uh, in Sugarland before. Um, but I also want to point out that it's one of the most diverse places in the country, arguably maybe the most diverse county in the country. And I also know there's an amazing food there. So I was wondering if you could give us some, like, hidden food gems that are your, like, go-tos when you're looking for lunch or dinner? Sure, uh, so uh, I always tell people, you know, we still have our barbecue in Texas, uh, we have our ribs, but uh, we also have our pho, we have our curry, we have a, have mm -hmm. our, our kung pao chicken, 
And uh, one of my favorite spots is actually just literally down the road from me. If you go down um, Highway 6 and 90, a place called A-Links. Um, so they, they've got they've got some really good a really good mix of Asian food, including Hakka food, if you've never tried it before. Because um, there's so many different types of Chinese food. I, I lived in Taiwan for two years. And one of my favorite things to do in every country that I've lived in is to do a food tour and take cooking classes, like Thai cooking classes in Chiang Mai. So uh, after we win this race, if anybody wants to do a cooking class with us, we'll do one on Instagram. <laughs> Sounds excellent. Yeah. Uh, are you? Is there anything you're really looking forward to from like your mom's cooking uh, coming up in the holiday season? You know, like uh, it's it's funny. It, it doesn't sound like something complicated, but um, spaghetti with meat sauce. Yeah, our meat sauce is very particular. The vegetables that we put in it, the way that we cook the, meat, the flavors in it. So I mean, you you can make anything really specific. Um, I also, we, we make guacamole a lot. Like I used to make it like three to five times a week, homemade guacamole. So that's something I love. Guacamole is one of the things I've learned during uh, quarantine. I started, I was like, well, I guess I might as well pick up guacamole making. And it is definitely something worthwhile to learn how to make yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things we would do with, with, on the team is every Friday, just to kind of keep that team cohesion, we would do a, a team cooking class. So we would, one person would teach the rest of us how, how to cook, and we'd do it from each of our, our houses. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I also know you've been um, abroad working with uh, special services, um, and you've been away from your family. Yeah. And I think kind of we've all been a little bit away from our family. Like I haven't seen my mom in a couple months now. And I was wondering if you have any tips for how people can stay connected or what your best practices were when you were so far away from everybody. So, you know, it's funny. So my mom uh, lives with me now. Um, so I get to see her every day. She helps out in the campaign. My sister came down for the primary in March. She only had four days of clothes with her. Uh, but because coronavirus, she uh, was living in California, coronavirus hit there first, she ended up staying with me for four months, and we talked about that, how great we were for having that time together, because you, you, we wouldn't usually have four months together at this stage in our life, so I was extremely grateful for that. My brother came down too, but now they're, they're up there on the East Coast. My other brother is in D.C. with my nephew, who I've only seen once since he's been born. He just turned one year old last week. I'm going to go see him in D.C. again after this, but uh, honestly, um, just spending a, a little bit of time, and we, we do these family Zooms, um, and you know, FaceTimes, and just thinking more about the time that you spend with your family right now. Um, my mom uh, actually reads books to, to her grandson, my nephew, on Zoom, <laughs> and we have pictures of him sitting right there, right in front of the screen. He's about you know, six or eight inches away from the screen watching his grandma read to him. So uh, I, I hope everybody's able to appreciate that time that we spend with our family this year because I mean, there's a lot of things that are going wrong in the world, but there's always something to be grateful for. Mm, for sure. That's adorable that she reads via Zoom. It's a little one-year-old. Yeah. Um, well, could you actually, on that same topic, though, could you talk a little bit about your foreign service? I know you've been all over the world, speak multiple languages, and I, it's also part of why you want to run for Congress, if I'm not mistaken. Could you just give a little bit of background, give some highlights, or what really you can bring to D.C. from this, from your past? Sure. So, um, yeah, I was in the Foreign Service. I served overseas uh, two years in Taiwan, two years in Russia. I was uh, three years in Jerusalem, a year and a half in Iraq. Uh, I did a few months in Jamaica and then back in D.C. doing uh, countering Russian disinformation. And I would say that the two biggest things from my time overseas are, one, uh, being able to see different perspectives, different ways of doing things. So the way they do, uh, you know, criminal justice um, in um, in uh, the Scandinavia, for example, the way they do uh, drug reform in Portugal, you know, they, they have a much better, um, a, a much better results uh, than we have with our war on drugs here in the United States. Um, uh, the, the way in, in Norway, they take um, their oil, which is the largest source of income, and they invest it into a renewable economy or geothermal energy in Iceland. So uh, looking at all of those different ways of addressing different problems, I think we, we have to have different perspectives, especially on these intractable problems, because I, I, I don't think they're actually intractable, but Sometimes they're politically intractable, and I think that's the other thing that I've learned from my time overseas. I specifically sought out places where there were disputed territories, like Jerusalem or Kirkuk, Iraq, and we had to bring people together, uh, form coalitions across uh, diverse groups of faith and ethnicity, even even in conflict, even in war zones. And so uh, I, I think that that's really necessary right now in America to try to bring people back together, because 
even if even when we win these elections in a few weeks, um, if we just win the elections and people are just as angry, I mean, I think a lot of folks are worried about what happens the day after. Then it, it's it's a pyrrhic victory. We have to be able to stitch our society back together again. And I tell people, you know, I'm, I plan to sit across the table uh, with people on the other side of the aisle and try try to work on problems together, not try to increase that hostility and division. We don't we don't answer anger with anger. You know, Martin Luther King said, "Hate does not drive out hate." Only love can do that. Uh, darkness does not drive out darkness. Only light can do that. So I, I say to folks, if, if I can sit across the table from somebody in Iraq who literally wanted to kill me, I can sit across the table from a Republican and work on a health care plan. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's a good one. Um, and so did you pick up these languages as you went, or where did they all come from? So, um, Spanish, I, I learned growing up here in Houston. Actually, anybody who's worked in a restaurant has probably picked up Spanish here, but almost any profession, it, it, you really need it, you know, medical profession, et cetera. But uh, I studied abroad when I was in college in Russia. It was actually the year that Vladimir Putin came to power and nobody knew who he was. And he's still there 20 years later. But it's one of the reasons why I joined the Foreign Service, because I saw uh, the need for stability around the world and the, the damage that corrupt governments could do. Uh, to to a country, which you know, we obviously we've we've seen some of the effects of that here in the United States now. Um, but uh, the rest of my languages, I learned uh, Chinese in Taiwan. I learned Hebrew uh, in Israel, and um, I was learning Hindi in preparation for my tour overseas in in India. I was supposed to be the, the spokesperson for the U.S. government, but then after I saw what was happening in our country, you know, the attacks on Barack Obama's birth certificate, calling migrants drug dealers and rapists, or saying a Latino couldn't be a fair judge. Uh, the call to ban all Muslims from the United States simply based on their faith. The final straw for me was the Charlottesville Nazi rally because people were asking, mm -hmm. is, is this controversial in America? Are there very fine people on both sides of this issue? And I said, no, 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 there's not. This is not controversial America, and, and this isn't what we stand for. So I decided the most patriotic thing to do would be to resign from the Foreign Service, come back home, and, and fight for our values. Uh, fight for a society that treats everybody with equality, dignity, and respect, and where we come together around big challenges. And obviously right now, the biggest challenge we've ever faced in our lives is coronavirus. And to me, that's an opportunity not to further divide, but an opportunity to further unite. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's been a pretty big theme of your entire campaign, mm -hmm. is grabbing people from every corner of your district and bringing people together. I think your campaign has also really gotten some national attention for how um, unique and original some of the programs you're doing. I know you are running in 21 different languages, some phone banks. Uh, when you initially had that idea, did people think you were crazy or like, how'd you get that off the ground? Yeah, may, maybe crazy, maybe idealistic, maybe a little stupid, some combination of them. <laughs> when I resigned from the Foreign Service, uh, I was literally one person. I was in my cousin's living room in Pearland, and I didn't have any money, didn't have any political connections whatsoever. But the interesting thing about uh, our district is it's the fastest growing district in the country. Um, we're, we're actually now larger than any district in America by uh, about 200,000 people bigger than the average congressional district. But one wow. quarter of all these folks are immigrants like my dad. You know, We started out an uh, immigrant family in a two-bedroom apartment with nine people in it. So why aren't we reaching out to these immigrants? And what I was told was, don't bother with them because they don't vote. And the easiest way to lose an election is to talk to people who don't vote. And I said, y'all lost by 35 points before. The easiest way to never get changed is to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get a different result. So, you know, I speak different mm -hmm. languages. Um, we recruited people from every one of the major immigrant communities. But now, I have to correct you, it's not now we're 27 languages that we're campaigning in, more than any campaign in U.S. history, and I'm, I'm really proud of it, uh, not just because we're speaking the languages, because sometimes folks will say, well, I don't I don't speak, you know, uh, like Gujarati as an example. Uh, my parents speak Gujarati. I don't speak it that well. And what I tell them is it's, it's even, it's not a matter of just whether someone speaks English or not. It's a matter of when they pick up that phone, if you just say Kimcho, or you're talking to uh, an Ismaili Muslim, Yali Madad, or, or uh, just one line, then it, what it tells people, you're part of my community. I see, and, and this could apply to anybody. So by the same token, if you walked into a black church and you knew nothing about African-American history or culture, and you just showed up and said, hey, come and vote for me right before the election, people would look at you a little bit skeptically. But if you actually spend the time showing up uh, at community events, um, you know, at, at cultural festivals, uh, 
eating the food uh, at, at weddings, <laughs> uh, um, being there in the community, not just talking, but also listening to, to what they care about. I think that that's the answer. I mean, we're, we're trying to run the most inclusive campaign ever because any any community can be diverse. Uh, you know, Houston's diverse, Texas is diverse, but diversity is who we are. Inclusion is what we do. And that's about pulling people together, getting them involved, making them feel like they have a, have a stake in our future together. And I think that that is the answer to everything around us, whether it's a, uh, the, the challenge of uh, police reform, whether it's the challenge of climate change, whether it's the challenge of the pandemic, it's all about turning turning this around instead of us versus them, uh, a zero sum game. How do we make this into a common challenge, an opportunity for all of us to unite and say, how can we overcome this together? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think watching your campaign, seeing your team on the ground is the inspiration that needs to be taken throughout the whole United States for all of them. Um, so, and you've actually kind of become a spokesperson for the API community um, because of your revolutionary ideas during your campaign. What's one thing that you've learned rolling out these programs that you wish other campaigns knew about or other campaigns would integrate into theirs? Well, look, you know, people always say, you know, what, what can I do to get out the, the Asian community? Right. Uh, and so like one candidate actually told me, uh, you know, I, I spent uh, $50,000 last time, you know, and it didn't it didn't help at all. And I said, what did you do? Well, yeah, I said uh, I paid for 50, for phone calls to all of these Asian voters. And I said, D did you ever show up at a, a mosque or a temple or a Chinese community center? Did you have any volunteers from these communities who speak these languages or know these cultures? And he said, well, no. So I said, well, you, you probably wasted your money then. Uh, the, the bottom line is after after millions of dollars and years of research, the way to get people to vote is to talk to them. <laughs> you have to have these conversations. And, and you have to realize that there's no community that's a monolith. So when you talk about the Asian community, there's not an Asian community. There's so many different Asian communities. And you have to spend time in the Vietnamese community, the Chinese community, the Indian community. But even among those, uh, there's there's so many sub-communities. And so that's why we, we talk to people in these different languages, there's a there's a Telugu culture association, Gujarati Samaj, uh, Maharashtra Mundo. There's different religious groups. You know, we we have all of our voters and volunteers listed as, uh, you know, Hindu or a Christian or or Sikh or Parsi or Jain or Sunni Muslim or Ismaili Muslim or Bori or Nigerians as Igbo or Yoruba or Latinos. Um, we have them listed as Colombian, Venezuelan, Dominican, Salvadoran, mm -hmm. Mexican American, Tejano American, because all of them are organized differently. But if you if you follow the networks, if you connect uh, people, we're not just running a campaign. What we're doing is trying to run the largest community organizing project we've ever had here, so that um, even after the election, all of those communities they they know um, that they have a voice in the highest halls of power. Every every single volunteer of ours. They will get an email every day of early voting with their friends, their family members, their neighbors. People will go to their church, their temple, or their mosque who have voted and haven't voted uh, so that they can push them out instead of us just having massive text banks and, and phone banks. And so that when I'm in Washington advocating for them, they know that they have a voice there. And I can communicate back to the community within those same networks so that they feel that connection. I think that's what we've lost in America. We've lost that faith in our representative democracy. And people think of the government as something separate from them. The government is us. That's what a democracy means. And, and and I think this community organizing project that we're talking about is going to restore that faith. And I think we're going to have a, 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 a transformational moment in American democracy in 2020. Absolutely. And we also need it. You know, there's so much on the line during this election, not only from saving our planet, but we <clears throat> putting somebody of actual decency in the highest office and also seats like yours. You know, you're in an open seat right now, which is very exciting. And well, it's time it to <laughs> <laughs> um, but So on that line now, I do want you to have a chance to uh, talk about your opponent a little bit. Uh, what is something that people need to realize about them? Well, okay, so there's, there's a difference between um, a politician and a public servant. A politician is someone who, who gets elected um, and you know our, our opponent, he's, he's been elected here before, but as a public servant, people have to be able to be responsible for their record. So you know whether it was uh, obstructing uh, another officer, destroying evidence, um, uh, lying on applications, being fired as a police officer, or profiling, uh, you know, answer those questions. Why, why is it that over 95% of the random stops here were against Latinos? Why is it that African Americans are twice as likely to be arrested here? other people why why did he use his political power 
to go after somebody, a political enemy, somebody who just had an anti-Trump bumper sticker on social media and then arrest them. Um, uh, why is it that, that uh, a family is suing him right now because their their teenager was sexually assaulted over 100 times uh, under his care? I mean, those are the kind of things that, as a public servant, you should be able to answer for your record. And probably the biggest thing to me is why why is he playing political games with our lives? And we know we know that, that some of the things that you can do to prevent from coronavirus are very easy. Just, just wearing a mask. That, that's one of the easiest things we can do. And it's not about being Republican or Democrat. He, he called wearing a mask communist and un-American. I think it's the most American thing we could do because it's about patriotism. If you care about your country, if you care about your fellow citizens, if you care about your community and even your family members, because they're the people most likely to be infected. I, I don't want to infect my mom who lives with me. So that's why I wear a mask. And that's why I think we need to get personal protective equipment out to our frontline healthcare workers, to our teachers, so they can educate in schools. That's why we have to have rapid testing so that um, people can get their results back within a few hours, not a week later, they can get back to work. That's, that's how we get back to normal, not by pretending that the problem doesn't exist, not by denying science. I mean, that, that's something that I shouldn't, we shouldn't have to argue about in 2020, that science is real. But we are. People are attacking doctors and public health professionals. Uh, we, we need to believe in science because what science is, it's evidence to shared reality, which means that we have a shared future together. Absolutely. Wall Street, I'm so excited that we have this time together. Uh, we're now going to move into our game, okay. uh, our game called This or That. So I'm going to list two different things, and you have to pick one. It's going to be pretty quick. So are you ready? All right, Flaming Hot Cheetos or Takis? Uh, Takis. Whataburger, in and out Whataburger. <laughs> Big Red, Dr. Pepper? Dr. Pepper. Big Ben, Enchanted Rock? Uh, that's a good one. I'll say Big Ben. RGV Tacos, Austin Tacos? Mm, I'll go Austin Tacos. Correct. China or Lone Star? What's that? China or Lone Star? Uh, for, for me, China. <laughs> queso salsa. Uh, there's a lot of different types of queso and a lot of different types of salsa. I, I'm not sure I can give that a binary answer, but um, uh, I'll, 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 t I'll take the queso that we make in my house. <laughs> Chili barbecue sauce. Oh, man. I've had some really, really good chilies. Uh, barbecue sauce can be hit or miss. I actually actually went on a tour when I was in college. I went to every rib joint there was in Austin trying to find the perfect rib. But um, uh, I, 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 will, I will say, like, a, a good chili, a really outstanding chili can be quite unique. All right. City, Hill Country. Mm, I'm in the suburbs here, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the hill country. I mean, I, I love my time in Austin, so. Uh, Houston, Dallas. <laughs> Is that really a question, man? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> hey, I grew up in Dallas, so you know, I just want to make sure. I, you know, I, I, I empathize with you, but yeah. <laughs> All right, and last one, late weekend or beach weekend? I mean, no offense to the folks in Galveston, but like our, our beaches are not the, the biggest world-class beaches, but I, I love Lake Travis. I, I love going out to the lake with friends, so I go lake. Excellent. Well, Trey, I've had such a good time. I'm so glad we got to learn a little bit more about you, and I cannot wait to see you in D.C. We all know voting starts on Tuesday. Do you have a voting plan? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll be out there uh, on Tuesday at the Smart Financial Center. So I'm, I'm actually really proud of the fact that the NBA made all of our stadiums, including Toyota Center in Harris County, a voting location. So that helps counteract the voter suppression that is coming out of Austin and, and Governor Abbott's office and people trying to stop us, uh, shut down voting locations and voting hours. And here in Fort Bend, I'm proud of our Fort Bend County just got elected in 2018 because we had a whole wave that happened in 2018 where it's like Wizard of Oz. Um, we went from black and white to sp springing into color. And uh, KP George has, has been a breath of fresh air here. He he got uh, the Smart Financial Center to also be a voting location. So people can come out, vote early, and they can vote safely because you everybody has the right to vote from their car if they want. You can call from your car, and they'll bring the ballot out to you. People don't realize that they have that right. So we're translating that information 
into 27 different languages. So I'll be out there on Tuesday, but we're going to have early voting days for every community. So we'll have a Chinese American early voting day, Indian American early voting day, Latino American uh, an early voting day for women, for senior, um, for, for people who work in the food service industry who've been out of work. So and any kind of community that you're part of, make sure that your entire community comes out. And if you want to help us, if you want to make some of those phone calls, if you want to volunteer in those 27 languages, if you want to connect us with some of the people that you know, because that's what relational organizing is, um, in Fort Bend or Brazoria or Harris County, go on our, our website, shri2020.com, SRI2020.com, slash action. You can come to one of our events. Come to our REACH competition and party. It's, it's actually a, a comp competition to see how many people you know in the district. And each person that you know, it racks up your score, but it also helps us GOTV people. It'll be fun. I'll be part of the competition. We'll see who, who gets the highest total. That's on Friday. That's our REACH competition. And on Saturday, we'll be with former presidential candidate, Secretary Julian Castro. We're doing a phone bank, um, especially if you speak Spanish or if you don't, if you just speak English, it's fine too. Come out and phone bank with us on Saturday. Go to Street 2020 slash action because we all need to be in action for the next three weeks. Absolutely. This is the time. Everybody's got to go vote. Everybody's got to bring five of their friends to go with them, make phone calls, donate money, go to the websites, and we're going to win this thing. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've got less than four weeks to save the world, y'all, so let's do it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again. If you have any voting questions, go to mytexasvotes.com. Feel free to call our hotline as well, 844-TEXAS-VOTES. And I will see you next time on the Texas Team with James. Have a great day.